Evening. Boy, howdy. Trying to get this thing to work right without being uh, too much, maybe. Really, Tyler? Really? Doesn't she feed you? No. <laughs> There's chips at church. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I go hungry some days because I ain't got no one to feed me neither. So how's everyone doing? Bueno. It's ours. Pastor Keith doesn't like it. Stay. All right. Tonight, we are going to cover some of these quote-unquote contradictions that uh, were discussed on the live broadcast that were kind of posed to me. Um, I'm not going to lie. At first glance, they seemed kind of like they were contradictions. Some of them were easily disputed, you know. Others, not so much. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at them. And one of the things that I was asked is that how would a new Christian who picked up the Bible and read it for the very first time, what happens if they read one of these verses and says, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense? Well, coming from someone who doesn't believe in God, I take that with about a grain of salt. Because if any of you ever met a new Christian who said, wait, the Bible's contradicting itself, I've never met one. I've met a lot of Christians. I've never met one. The only people I've ever met in my life that who ever find contradictions in the Bible, are atheists. Or at, or at the very least agnostics in one fashion or the other. Which are atheists. <laughs> they're religious, but they don't believe in God. So by my perspective, there is only one. So anyone who does not believe in him is atheistic in one fashion or another. Now they are deists or theists of one fashion, but that's just to believe in a God, not so much the God. Which is also why I distinguish Christianity from every other religion, and I don't call it a religion. Because to me, it's not. It's a different category. Um, Christina sent me this link in these knuckleheads in Sweden, Germany, somewhere. Dutch? Yeah, these two Dutch guys. They put the Bible inside of a Quran cover, and they read something out of it to these strangers. You know, they only have two examples. It's like the whole video that you only have two examples, that's it. And But all it shows is they read these two scriptures, and people are appalled, like, well, I can't believe they believe that. That's just nonsense. And the guy's like, well, look, it's a Bible. He, 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 we tricked you. Your Bible is horrible or whatever. It's like, no, that's stupid. You can take any one verse, stand on one verse, and make it a contradiction. We've mentioned it before, you know. the God does not hear the prayers of sinners. Well, who said it? High priest Caiaphas. And actually, this other day, I saw someone actually post that same verse on um, Pastor Charles Lawson's uh, website, saying that he just made said, Pastor Lawson said something, and the guy's like, "No, that doesn't. None of this is all this is pointless because God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners." And he puts the verse up there. I'm like, "You're quoting an apostate. You're quoting the man who championed and rallied the people to crucify Christ. That's who you're quoting." It's like they don't get it. You can take any one verse and make it something really horrible. If that man's right, that means nothing. If God doesn't hear the praise of sinners, that means nothing we do matters. We can't seek forgiveness because you've got to pray to him to, seek for, to receive forgiveness, right? It has to be kind of a between. But if he doesn't hear you, we're all screwed flat out. It's just about the dumbest thing I've ever heard anybody say and worse for someone who claims to be a Christian. So let's go into some of these. Now, the first one that I was asked was the hours of crucifixion, okay? Now, is everybody here aware of the Synoptic Gospels? You know what that is? No? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. Now, the difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you've ever read the gospels, it's pretty easy to see John is drastically different in the way it's written and everything else from the other three. Okay? They're all telling the same story, but there's just something very different about John. And at a later date, we will go into why Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels and so on and so forth. Okay? But for the time... Well, since we don't have four hours to go into all that, we're just going to keep it simple and just, I just want to make the point. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are different from John, okay? Now, we're not given an exact time of Christ's death. We're not. This is what Matthew says, Matthew 7, or 27, 45. Now, 
from the sixth hour darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. Luke 23:44. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Almost mirroring images of each other, except for a word or two. Mark 15, 25. It was the third hour when they crucified him. Obviously talking about Christ. Okay? Do you guys see that as a contradiction? Why not? Now from the sixth hour, darkness was fell upon the whole land, or upon all the land, until the ninth hour. Well, at this point, he had not died yet in any of these verses. Now here's the key to it, okay? Matthew and Luke, he's already on the cross. Okay? So it was about, Mark tells us, it's about the third hour when they crucified him. Okay? So what time did he, was he crucified? No. And that's where people get messed up. The sixth hour, darkness over the the sixth hour to the ninth hour, that's not from six to nine. That's not what it means. Here's where you people get their, their times mixed up. I know to us, that makes sense. We use Roman timekeeping. Jews used a different time at that point in time. The third hour was from six, a three-hour period, from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. The sixth hour was 9 to 12, 9th, 12 to 3, 12th, 3rd to 6th, first watch from 6 to 9, second watch, 9 to 12, third watch, 12 to 3, and fourth watch, 3 to 6. That's how it went. So when Matthew says, from, from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the earth until the ninth hour, that means for somewhere between 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., there was darkness over the land. That's a six-hour span. It's somewhere. This is about the sixth hour until the ninth. Well, the ninth is also a three-hour span, about the sixth, which could be somewhere anywhere at the end of the sixth hour to the beginning of the sixth hour. It's a three-hour gap as well. It's not specific. It doesn't give us that kind of detail. And in Luke, where it says he was crucified... Um, it was the third hour when they crucified him. That means he was crucified between 6 and 9 a.m. That's where we get it. Okay? So that's what basically shoots the whole contradiction out of the water. You know? It's because, now granted, to a baby Christian, they're not going to know that. But what is a baby Christian doing? They're in church, right? They should be if they're a baby Christian. They should definitely be in church when the doors are open. So they should be saying, hey, pastor, I have a question. This says this and that says that. I don't understand. Okay? But so far, even if we were using Roman time for Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we'd still have no contradiction because Matthew and Luke are, perfect, are perfectly lined up, and Mark is basically saying there was darkly, there was, or he was crucified at this time. The first two were saying it was between this and there was darkness. But Matthew and Luke don't say what time he was crucified. You put the three together, and he was crucified at the third hour, six to nine, and then between the sixth and ninth hour is when darkness was over the land. Now, when the darkness was done, he gave up the spirit. That's what follows after that. It's when he died. Okay? Here's where you would find a contradiction between the others. This is John 19, 14, and 15. Chapter 19, verses 14, 15. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, hmm, Probably Caiaphas, you think? Maybe? I don't know. We have no king but Caesar. Okay? Now, here's the thing. And I will go into this later, I promise you, in a lot more detail. John does not record anything by Jewish time. He recorded everything by Roman time. There is a lot of documentation and a lot of things to support this. And just the way he wrote, the manner that he did things, that's also why it's one of the reasons it's excluded from being one of the synoptic gospels, because the first three are more, tell, like they're more mirror images of each other, and John is more giving you a spiritual perspective of Christ. Just the way that it's written, and there's a lot, a lot better explanations, and I don't have those notes with me, because it can get really fuzzy really quickly if you're not careful. So I will cover that at a later time. But if you're curious to do a little search research on your own, to research why John was used in Roman time versus the other. Or you guys can wait and I'll get into that in a later date. But, so when you change John, it says it was about the sixth hour and he said to the Jews, Behold, 
here's your king, shall I crucify him, yada, 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 so on and so forth, okay? The six, if he's using Roman time, that means the third hour, when he said, shall I crucify him? Is what? Um, the day of preparation of Passover. He said, shall I crucify your king? And so if it was about 6 a.m., because he's using Roman time, that means it was, about the th- it, was, it was about the third hour, about 6 p.m. He's being more precise. It was about 6 a.m., which is the beginning of the third hour, which means, or at least somewhere in the third hour, which means at the very least, they still had two hours to get him on the cross to still fall within the third hour timeline. That is not that far from where they were holding everything to Golgotha, you know? Wouldn't take two hours to get there and get the man on the cross. I can drive a nail in a few minutes. Even through a man's arm, you know? There's only three nails. And stand it up. Still, well, um, the name is sketching at the moment, but half the cross was carried for my portion of the way. Simon, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just one of those things. It's like, it, it got done. It didn't take two hours to get there. Pontius Pilate's probably somewhere in the general courtyard area for wherever they had their headquarters and at the most, I imagine it's like about 30 or 45 minutes to get there, 10, 15 minutes to string him up, and he's within the third hour. And basically all we know is that it was, a, it was, a, it was during the 6th, around six, somewhere in 6 a.m. time frame that they were having in the court where he issues the command to crucify him. So it's just, it's, it's not a contradiction. None of these are contradictions. The first, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are perfectly aligned. They don't contradict each other whatsoever. The only one you could possibly find one if you don't realize that John is not usually marking Roman time instead of Jewish time. That's, that would be it. That's the only place you could find one. So you go from there. Well, think of a good book you read. Anyone who reads books, you know? The first time through, I don't read books either much. Uh, it's all I can do to read this one. You know, it's the only one that matters. But people who, anyone who's ever read a good book, like just one good book, in their life. I'm sure everyone's at least one, at least one they enjoyed. The first time through, you don't catch everything. Almost like a movie. The first time through, you miss some things. Second time through, you catch those little details, things you miss the second time, okay? So for a baby Christian to come across this, to read Matthew, unless they have just one of those ironclad memories, they're not going to go read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, hit John, all of a sudden, wait a minute, didn't Matthew, Mark, and Luke say this? And no. Until someone tells you, well, that's a contradiction in the Bible, and then they go look for it. And then they get confused, and they go to their pastor. But if your pastor doesn't know this, a little bit of research can go a long ways. But at the same time, if you research it, and all you find is just atheist stuff online, you know, they're all, they're all reinforcing what you were just told, and you're not going to the right sources, there's plenty of Christian people out there who are, have this totally backwards. You know? There's all kinds of them out there, and it's really scary. Like the Christian man who claims to be a Christian and says, God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners. It's like, are you... Are you Special? I mean, really? Just, that means you can't seek forgiveness. Like, this isn't brain surgery. It's a contra- that is a contradiction. Pray to God for forgiveness. Well, he doesn't, you're a sinner. He doesn't hear your prayers. Well, you can't receive righteousness or <laughs> forgiveness. If, you know, uh, yeah. It's just like you stopped somewhere. You didn't follow the logic through. And it's scary how more and more frequently I'm coming across this stuff. I asked the guy flat out, I'm like, so uh, let me ask you one question. Who was speaking in that verse? He never responded. I wonder why. I'm probably not the first person to ask him that question. But if I'm not, that means he's heard it before. If he's heard it before, how was he not seeing it? And there's two words that perfectly describe that. Willful ignorance. Everyone almost everyone, a vast majority of this country, they think they got the bull by the tail on a downhill pull. I know, what's, I, I know what I need to know. I don't need to know what you believe. I know I'm right. Well, I usually think that, but if someone shows me something, I will dig into that thing and I will make sure I'm right on it. And if I'm not, I'll be the first one to tell you, hey, 